So good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Karen Sims Gallagher, Dean of the USC Rossier School of Education, and we are very pleased to see a large audience today for this really important event. Um, I want to thank Superintendent Daisy for agreeing to speak today, and also my colleagues in the USC Gould School of Law and the USC Price School of Public Policy for their support for this lecture. I'd like to introduce uh, Dean Robert Rasmussen. Uh, Bob, would you stand up? He's the Dean of the School of Law over here. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> I'm sure all in this room will agree that teaching well is among the highest of skills, no matter if we're talking about elementary, secondary, or tertiary education. Superintendent Daisy and I have had discussions about the complex and important work of effectively preparing and then fairly evaluating teachers. We spend a great deal of time in the School of Education preparing people through our MAT program to enter as effective novice teachers. Now, obviously, the case of uh, Vergara versus the state of California is a backdrop today and gives us an opportunity to talk about teaching, dismissals, permanent employment, and seniority-based layoffs. This case has already been uh, labeled as a landmark, and it will, be uh, it will decide the fate of several provisions of the California Education Code, which plaintiffs have maintained for school district administrators to keep ineffective teachers in classrooms year after year. Both sides uh, rested last week, and we can expect a ruling um, after 90 days after April 10th, so we're, we'll, we will be waiting. But we have, uh, we have Superintendent Daisy in our panel today to uh, talk about many of the issues. Following Dr. Daisy's speech, he will join a panel of USC faculty members to, who will offer their thoughts on the issues that Vergara raises. And we will save ample time for questions and answers. So be prepared for that. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Superintendent John Daisy, who heads an incredibly complex and dynamic organization. Los Angeles Unified School District has about 650,000 students in kindergarten through 12th grade and at nearly 1,000 schools. It employs over 3,000 teachers and is the second largest public school district in the country. LAUSD's boundaries sp uh, spread over 720 square miles and includes Los Angeles and parts of 31 smaller municipalities, plus several unincorporated sections of Southern California. When he took office over this massive structure in 2011, John Daisy was unequivocal about his focus to protect students' rights to a high quality education through educational policy, negotiation, legislation, and the courts. He has also been clear in his stated goal, ensuring that there are effective employees at every level of the organization, focused on improving student outcomes. Superintendent Daisy has been director of Deputy Director of Education at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, Superintendent in Prince George's County in Maryland, where he earned a national reputation for his leadership in significantly narrowing the achievement gap between low-income and minority students and their peers. He also, uh, before uh, Prince George, uh, was earlier uh, the superintendent at Santa Monica Malibu here in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, before that, uh, superintendent in Rhode Island. He's been a Broad Fellow, an Aspen Institute Entrepreneurial Leader for Public Education Fellow, an Annenberg Fellow, and a State Superintendent of the Year. He has lots of uh, experience. We're really looking forward to his remarks today. J please welcome John Dacey. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to um, uh, a robust evening um, in terms of the conversation that I hope that we'll be able to have. <clears throat> Small bit of background. Uh, the trial, uh, Vigara versus State of California, closed yesterday. And in keeping with uh, the expectations of the judge, I have no comment on it whatsoever until the trial was over. 
Um, and I'll be glad to engage in any conversation this evening, except anything that would posit opinion on how I thought the judge did. Anything about the judge whatsoever uh, is inappropriate until a verdict is handed down. So that would be the one area. Otherwise, I hope we could have a good conversation. The difference between people who have their dreams fulfilled and those people who have their dreams deferred is education. Of all of the rights and the privileges and the gifts we have as citizens of these United States of America, I believe that the greatest by far is that we live under the rule of law. This is the synchronon of democracy and of the republic we have forged. I posit that this fundamental construct heralded by the text of the unanimous Declaration of Independence of the 13 states, embedded in our Constitution, and honed through the intersection of the separate structures of our government in its form of legislative, executive, and judiciary branches, is the central reason why we're the only democracy on earth to have survived a civil war intact. So with deep respect and a profound acknowledgement of both our history and in the right to free speech, public debate, and civil discourse, underline the word civil, I want to attempt this afternoon a discourse in the truest style of the essay, a trial of ideas, on the subject of public education in terms of the laws under which we are governed, when those who are governed have not an individual or a direct voice, not power, nor recourse to claim injustice or seek redress without the, adult of an, without the aid of an adult. Specifically, I want to engage in a trial of ideas around the rights of youth inside the grand and public education system of this country. In public education, all of the adults and all of the employed have clearly articulated and well-protected historic rights in at least three venues, constitutionally declared rights, state legislated rights, and the power of law found in the rights of collectively bargained labor agreements. <clears throat> I struggle to find the equivalent for youth. So to find a path to a place where the balance of rights are found for both the youth in the system and the adults who work incredibly hard in the system, I'm going to suggest that we're going to travel from the Constitution of the United States to the Constitution of the State of California and through the significant legal cases that either make explicit or direct an equal protection under the law for the youth of California's public schools that will set a basis that will end, as it did last week, in a courthouse here in Los Angeles at the close of the Vergara trial. So let me quote. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And with that sentence in the preamble of the Declaration of Independence, the three fundamental ideals are articulated in this founding document of the American political tradition from which birthed the foundation of our rule of law and formed our nation. One, all men are created free and equal. Two, all possess the same inherent natural rights. And three, legitimate government must be based on the consent of the governed and must exist to secure those rights. Astonishing in its time and remarkable even as of today in our world context. And even as of last week, we, through various branches of government, to either clarify or ensure or compel the governed to act within the framework of those rights. Yesterday, excuse me, last week the trial closed after a month long trial that here in a courtroom in Los Angeles. And it was very much about a set of these rights. Now we know that sometimes this happens quickly, but most times it's quite slow. As the most powerful example, let's remind ourselves of some facts of timing. The Declaration of Independence was voted upon on Congress on July the 2nd, 1776, and then unanimously approved by Congress on the evening of July the 4th, 1776, without debate on the draft wording, except for a single sentence by Jefferson, which vehemently condemned slavery. The sentence was omitted. Nearly 100 years later, on January the 31st in 1865, in a House Joint Resolution, 
was pass the 13th Amendment to that Constitution, which sought to abolish slavery. Twelve months later, on December the 6th of that year, the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States was ratified in Congress, which in its most succinct form said, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States or any place subject to its jurisdiction, except as punishment for a crime whereof the party has been duly convicted. Now the conscience of America, her leaders, and its governed didn't simply wake up on the morning of January the 31st and say, hey, we realized that framework of the Constitution and the founding document of the Republic and the Declaration forgot the part about all men being created equal except for slaves. I guess we better do something about that and stop slavery. We know all too well our history. The amendment was introduced in the last months <clears throat> of a horrific civil war, which had been raging since 1861. And at its heart was fought over the maintenance, or worse, the expansion of slavery or its abolishment. And of note, that 13th Amendment was only ratified after the fateful morning of April the 9th of that year at that famous courthouse in Appomattox. What we know is that the enactment and insurance and enforcement of the three fundamental ideals of the Republic so eloquently stated in the Declaration of Independence are and will be difficult, hard to do at times, painful at times, and sometimes tragically violent in demand and resolution, but nevertheless necessary, and I actually say inevitable, so long as we operate under the rule of law. And the second thing we know is that no single act, no single law, or amendment to our Constitution has been sufficient to fully realize this triptych of ideals in this country, those, of course, being that all men are created free and equal, possess the same natural rights, and legitimate government is based on the consent of the governed and is there to secure those rights. One of the most painful but important reminders in this history of the 13th Amendment is that one would have thought that its ratification would have ended slavery. But no, it actually necessitated the 14th and then the 15th Amendment in order to strengthen these self-evident truths of the newly freed slaves by having to constitutionally guarantee that no state shall deprive anyone of either due process of law or equal protection of law. And further, in the 15th, prohibiting any state from denying anyone the right to vote due to race. This brief history lesson serves to form the base of my essay in that the 14th Amendment was not solely about the rights guaranteed to newly freed slaves, but in its own language, no state shall deprive anyone of either due process of law or of equal protection of law. That was so ratified without a single modification to the age of, the race of, the religion of, the gender of, the zip code of, the native language of, the wealth of, the sexual orientation of, or the disability of that anyone. However, to further clarify the point that the enactment, enforcement, and insurance of this secular, sacred triptych of the fundamental ideals of this democracy are not simply violated or fought for or upheld in the legislative or executive branches, or in the streets for that matter at times, but we have learned that it is the judicial branch that has both enhanced and at times thwarted this critical set of ideals. I will return to this as to why it has helped form my view and have helped shape my leadership here in Los Angeles and in this state when it comes to the rights of youth. I believe that we not only live to be a better self and a better republic by understanding the stain of slavery alone, but rather only when we understand the stain of slavery and the stain of segregation. So if we think back to the history a bit more, some 22 years after the ratification of the 15th Amendment, a black man in New Orleans refused to give up his seat on a white, to a white man on a train in the state of Louisiana. He was arrested and jailed. He believed that this was not legal and that it had violated his right of equal protection under the not so newly provided for 14th Amendment to the Constitution. 
And by 1896, some 30 years after the ratification of the 14th Amendment, his case was in front of the Supreme Court of the United States of America, the ultimate manifestation of the rule of law. That man was Homer Plessy, and that case was Plessy versus Ferguson. In an eight to one decision by the Supreme Court of this country, the court ruled against Plessy, and writing for the majority, Justice Henry Billings Brown, a white male, educated at Harvard and Yale, born in the northern slave-free state of Massachusetts, penned. The object of the 14th Amendment was to undoubtedly enforce the equality of the two races before the law. But in the nature of things, it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color or to endorse social as distinguished from political equality. If one race be inferior to the other socially, the Constitution of these United States of America cannot possibly put them on the same plane. The sole dissenter to that decision was Justice John Marshall Holland, a white male born to a slave-holding family in the state of Kentucky and attended a public high, uh, college. In his dissent, he writes that the white race deems itself to be the dominant race in this country, and so it is, prestige, in an education, in achievements, in wealth, and in power. So I doubt not it will continue to be for all time if it remains true to its great heritage and holds fast to the principles of constitutional liberty. But in the view of the Constitution and in the eyes of the law of this country, there is in this country no superior dominant or ruling class of citizen. There is no caste system here. Our Constitution is colorblind, neither knows nor tolerates classes amongst its citizens. In respect to civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. The law regards man as man and takes no account of his surroundings or his color in terms of his civil rights. They are guaranteed by the supreme law of the land inviolate. If evil is going to result from the commingling of two races on a public highway system established to benefit all, they will be infinitely less than those that will surely come from state legislation regulating the enjoyment of civil rights based upon race. We boast of the freedom enjoyed by our people above all people on this planet. But it is difficult to reconcile that boast with a state of the law which practically puts the brand of servitude and degradation upon large classes of our fellow citizens. The thin disguise of equal but separate accommodations for passengers in a railroad coach will not mislead anyone nor atone for the wrong done today. It is interesting to note that it is going to be that justice's grandson who will serve on the Warren Court some 60 years later, who will partake in the infamous unanimous Brown versus Board of Education decision that will depart from stare decisis and strike down the doctrine engendered in Plessy of separate but equal. It's a good note for the future. There's power in dissent and the seemingly contrarian voice when all others are screaming. I might posit that the 14th Amendment has and will hold more power to protect the triptych of our democratic principles than any previous or quite possibly future amendment to the document for which we enjoy in this country, life under the rule of law. Most unfinished business in this country, where the aggrieved pray before a court for relief or recompense, form a prayer on the principles of the triptych that are fortified by that 14th Amendment. And in beginning to examine the road to youth rights in public education, and currently in this state of California, I'm going to suggest that the best place to start, as we have now an understanding of the 14th Amendment's place in history, is Brown versus the Board of Education. There's also the need to understand the power of the small act, the profanely courageous act, the dissident act, the unpopular act, not just in symbolism, but the act of manifestation of injustice being corrected and then a demand for cure under the rule of law. Refusing to give a seat up on public transportation. 
drinking from a water fountain, walking across a bridge, entering a schoolhouse, demanding a good education, wanting a great teacher. Let me remind you of one of those acts. At 4.30 in the afternoon of Monday, February the 1st, 1960, four college students sat down at a lunch counter in Woolworths in downtown Greensboro, North Carolina. They were all freshmen at North Carolina A&T, the black college a mile away. I would like a cup of coffee, please, said Easel Blair to the waitress. We don't serve Negroes here, she said. The Woolworths counter was a long L-shaped bar that could sit 66 people with a stand-up snack bar at one end. The seats were for whites, and the snack bar where four could stand were for blacks only. An employee, a black woman who was working at the steam table, approached the students and said, you're acting stupid and ignorant. She tried to warn them. They didn't move. Around 5.30, the front doors of the store closed, and they continued to sit there. Finally, they left by the side door and were greeted by a very small crowd and a reporter from the Greensboro record, and their only comment is, we'll be back tomorrow. By the next morning, the protests had grown to 25 men and four women, mostly from the same dormitory of the original four. They were dressed, of course, in suits and ties, and the student had brought their schoolwork. The next day, they were joined by the Negro Secondary School, Dudley High School, and the number of protesters swelled to 80. By Thursday, the number had been 300, including three right women from the Greensboro campus of the University of North Carolina. By Saturday, 600 had spilled out into the streets. White teenagers waved Confederate flags through firecrackers, and by noon, the a and football team arrived, and as the students said, the wrecking crew is here. By the following Monday, sit-ins had now spread to Winston-Salem, 25 miles away, Durham, 50 miles away, and the day after, students at Fayetteville State Teachers College, Johnson Smith College, and Charlotte joined in, followed on Wednesday by students of St. Augustine and Shaw and Raleigh. On Thursday and Friday, the protests had crossed state lines. Hampton and Portsmouth in Virginia, Rock Hill in South Carolina, Chattanooga in Tennessee. By the end of the month, there were sit-ins all over the entire South and as far west as Texas. Every 70, eventually 70,000 students took part in this. Thousands were arrested and untold others radicalized. And the events became the center of the initial civil rights movement that engulfed the South for the rest of a decade. It all happened without a single email, a single tweet, a single Facebook posting, and not a single posting on Facebook. There is power in the small act. I would like a cup of coffee. I want to go to a good school. The road to striking down segregation in public schools in this country and abolishing Plessy began in 1936. Thurgood Marshall, several years earlier himself, was rejected from the law school at the University of Maryland because of their racial practices. We know he goes on to be a lawyer. And in the summer of 1935, he argues a case before the Baltimore City Court that a young man named Donald Murray Gaines was rejected from admittance from the law school of the University of Maryland solely because he was black. He argued in front of a white court that Mr. Murray was just as qualified as white applicants and further, that he argued that the black school he would be forced to attend was nowhere near as qualified as that school in Maryland. So it was violating the very principle of separate but equal. The city court of Baltimore agreed and the university immediately appealed. In 1936, the Supreme Court of the State of Maryland upheld and Murray was admitted. 1938, Gaines denied admission to the University of Missouri based on race. Equal protection for whites, but not blacks. Upheld, she gained admittance. 1950, Sweet denied admittance to Texas Law School. All the way to the Supreme Court. Schools were separate, but unequal. Granted admission. Two hours later on the exact same day in June, 1950, McLaurin versus Oklahoma, denied admission. Same day verdict, upheld. McLaurin entered University of Oklahoma. Separate but not equal. All were higher ed decisions. All were citizens who could vote. All were able to raise their voice. 
But in 1954 and 1955, the case of Brown versus the Board of Education came to the Supreme Court. Now, actually, it was five cases, as you know, that came to the court in 1952. They were all consolidated into one case, and Thurgood Marshall again stood before the court and argued fundamentally that separate but equal was not real and inherently wrong. The justices were deeply divided, and in a rarity, the court ended its term without handing down a ruling. The next year, the justice ordered the case to be retried in front of the Supreme Court. We know, of course, that during that summer, Justice Vincent had died and had been replaced by Governor Earl Warren of this great state. He was elevated to Chief Justice and accomplished what no court before had done, a unanimous decision declaring that the segregation in our public schools was unconstitutional and that the doctrine of separate but equal had no place in the field of public education in the United States. We know the rest of our history. We are still struggling some 60 years post this decision to enact the promise of Brown. The notion that under the rule of law in this country, equal protection under the law is the rule of the land, and that separate but equal has no place in public education. I am troubled by how we today, in 2014, can witness such unequal, non-protected classes of youth in a single institution called public education. Our work is not done. And I personally find it so grievous in the state of California, given our own history. We didn't wait for Brown in California. More than 11 years earlier, on February the 18th, in 1946, in a Los Angeles courtroom not far from this school, the case of Mendes versus Westminster was heard and ruled that segregation by schools, by race, in this case Mexican and white, was unconstitutional and was a denial of the Equal Protection Clause. The case moved quickly to the Ninth Circuit and was upheld. Within weeks, then Governor Earl Warren signed into law the repeal of all of the state's segregationist laws. <clears throat> Here in Los Angeles, students entered the schoolhouse regardless of color of their skin, but it would be more than 20 years later, in the east side of this city, the nation would watch a series of nationally televised walkouts and protests, the fact that youth could not get into classes that would give them college credit. Mendez ruled the front door of the schoolhouse. Plessy was still ruling the classroom door of the school. We continue to struggle. Just recently, in the 21st century, the school board of the Los Angeles Unified School System enacted and affirmed a policy that every youth would have access to the A through G required courses. That's more than a century after Plessy. I'm going to quickly lead us to what took place last Friday, and then I'm going to comment on the substance of this case and compel us to understand that, in my view, why it's not only important, but essential. In 1946, we had Mendez. Equal protection meant equal access to school regardless of race. 1971, Serrano versus Priest. John Serrano was the parent of one of several LA Unified students. Vergara is not new. Ivy Baker Priest was the state treasurer at the time. The funding of public schools was unequal and violated the equal protection under the law, the 14th Amendment and embedded in the state constitution of this state. Stemming from the court case in 1968, the Superior Court of Los Angeles found that California's method of funding public schools because of district to district disparities failed to meet the requirements of the 14th Amendment and violated the Constitution of California. District to district inequities resulted in disparities and a lesser educational opportunity depending on where you lived. And in the three subsequent decisions it has taken to enact Serrano, Serrano II, Prop 13, and compliance, they have all sought to implement the original Serrano case. And of course, we still struggle today. The Butt case, a school district could not shorten its school year by six weeks because it was having mon money problems. Students have the right to the same amount of time in school. So far that we've established that there's equal protection in the law for fiscal support, that's not disproportional, and for time, that is not disproportional. 2004, Williams, unequal investment is required to provide equal opportunity. 2010, Reed, in here in Los Angeles, <clears throat> 
The Reed case was a state decision to reduce funding uh, that resulted in the violation of the 14th Amendment in the Constitution. When we went through the series of unprecedented budget cuts, districts around the state were required to lay teachers off in accordance with the statutes at the time. I was in that trial and I was on the stand for three days. The result of that last in, first out, or sometimes called the life out statute, was aggravated and activated by the fiscal situation. There were gross disparities to youth and to some classes of youth. There were a number of schools who had the majority of their faculty as very young in their career or their lowest seniority number. Examples were Markham, Gompers, Lathy, and there were others. When the layoffs came in that year, those faculty saw 40, 50, and 70% of their entire staff laid off because of their seniority while other faculties across LAUSD had few and some had none of their faculty laid off. It is further the note that these schools had the student body of the most impacted youth. They all lived in circumstances of poverty and peril. Nearly all struggled to speak English with proficiency as their first language. And almost the entirety of the student body was black or brown. At the end of that ruling, the judge here in Los Angeles found that students had a constitutional right to stability, that it was fundamentally a violation to remove that large number of faculty. Second, that you can't collectively bargain away students' rights. And thirdly, that certain schools are disproportionately affected by LIFO. Thus, declaratory relief included the skipping of the most important impacted schools by this statute. We chose to take his ruling and enact it. And in those schools, which are called Reed schools, when the next year of rifts came, they were skipped over. And that those rifts went further out into the system. That case has continued to be appealed and has been remanded uh, by UTLA. Now we've established that youth have an equal protection under the law for stability and continuity of the teachers that they need and deserve. That is not disproportionate. Then the recent court case of Doe versus Dacey compelled the district to adhere to the Stull Act as it was modified in General Assembly. We had for years been implementing a teacher evaluation system that was not compliant with the Stull Act. And as a result of that, the judge ordered that we were not in compliance and we sought a negotiated agreement. That negotiated agreement was enacted and is being challenged in the PERB venue. So now comes Vigara. We've argued and fought and have established that California children have an equal opportunity to access education without regard to race or nationality, have an equal opportunity to the same level of funding without regard to their residence, have an equal opportunity to be supported in the materials and facilities they need to learn, have an equal opportunity to the same amount of time to attend school without regard to the fiscal conditions of their city or their school district, have an equal opportunity to the same stability of faculty without regard to the seniority of the staff of the school they happen to attend, and have an equal opportunity to be assured that the evaluation process used for the quality and development of the teachers will be followed as is intended in the law. Should they not have the same equal opportunity to the quality of instruction without regard to any law that may otherwise compromise that. The constitution of this state, among other things, guarantees that education is, quote, essential to the preservation of the rights and liberties of the people, and further states that any person may not be denied equal protection under the law. Our 14th Amendment to the Constitution is embedded in our own state constitution. The Supreme Court of California has long history in recognizing that equal opportunity to access quality education is every child's fundamental constitutional right. So in May of 2010, nine California public school children, several from Los Angeles, filed a lawsuit now known as Vigara versus California. The suit seeks to strike down a set of statutes that they believe keep schools and districts from preventing a student's right to equal protection under the law. In short, these statutes, as they stand and are operationalized, do not prevent grossly ineffective teachers from being in front of youth, but disproportionately so 
in front of youth who live in circumstances of poverty, who are black, who are Latino, and do not speak English proficiently as their first language. In short, they seek to strike down, as currently written and enacted, the following statutes. The Permanent Employment Statute, or commonly called the Tenure Law. In California, this grants tenure after two years of successful service in the state of California. In order to make that law and follow the compliance, a principal and a teacher would have to have gone through evaluation and the principal would have decided to either award or not award tenure in about 14 months because you have to have your first year and then you have to make the deadlines of the second year to provide due and appropriate notice, provide that decision to the Board of Education, have the Board of Education act on that decision and then notify the employee before March of the second year. The entire program that we use to support teachers, BITSA, doesn't conclude by the time a person has already decided whether they have or do not have tenure. The very supports to help you become a great teacher are not completed by the time an award decision has to be given in tenure. The second is the dismissal statutes. This is a very different statute. This governs how teachers are fired. In short, there is a very lengthy, very detailed, somewhat convoluted to understand process by which a teacher is fired in the state of California. The reasons for firing are serious. Sometimes they're grave. Sometimes they take into account gross misconduct, violations of laws, inability to teach. And in California, school boards hire teachers, but they don't fire teachers. They accept a recommendation, and then the process moves to an outside entity headed by a law judge and a panel of three teachers who then hears a case and then makes a decision and either upholds it or remands it. And then there's a series of 11 steps towards appeal you can do after that. It sometimes takes years to terminate a teacher, sometimes decade to terminate a teacher. It was argued in the case that teachers in the most egregious behavior, there must be a quicker way to exit them from the system. And the last of the statutes is the last in, first out, or LIFO statute, which governs which teachers are to be dismissed when fiscal circumstances require a reduction in force. And the way that this works is that we use seniority as the basis. Skipping is permitted if you own a license or a credential that is deemed important, but it still must be in order of seniority. So therefore, the youngest teachers in terms of service to the district go first on up. I personally agree that the challenge statutes harm certain groups of youth, and I have believed that for many years. I agree that there is a better and more responsible way to deal with the underlying circumstances for which these statutes are required. I agree that egregious and irreparable harm comes to youth, some youth, and not all youth, when the statutes are applied equally across a system. In other words, I believe that the equal treatment of youth in unequal circumstances isn't justice. I also believe that teachers should and must have tenure, and all of the protections that come with tenure, and that are afforded to a teacher when this incredibly important decision is made. I don't believe that I or anybody else could possibly make such a judgment in 14 months. I think it's a disservice to the honor of the profession. I don't think it should be forever, but I do believe that the ability of time to have even remediated and provided the support should at least be completed before you make a decision that a district in California will provide that teacher employment for life. I also believe that it should be easier to fire teachers who commit egregious harm and criminal acts to children and who after significant investment in their development and improvement can't demonstrate that they can meet the standards that a district has established for competence. And I believe that when forced to by fiscal circumstances beyond our control, we have to reduce the number of teachers. I believe that we honor the profession by considering factors other than the date that they are hired. 
as a basis for having to make this gut-wrenching decision. That the simple credential and licensure status isn't a proxy for competence. It's a precursor for growing competent in the profession. So when I was deposed in the case, and when I was summoned and stood in the stand for three days, I testified to such, and to the harm that the current statutes cause, and my devastation in seeing that when I follow these laws, I see that they violate the, youth, the rights of some of our youth. I don't believe that striking them down and eliminating them is what this is about. It's about is there a path to where the youth have a set of rights that the adults can have. I am convinced that the rights of adults can and must coincide in the same strength as the constitutional rights of youth in our school. I do believe that all means all. I think all youth and adults in public schools are created free and equal. I believe that all youth and adults in public schools possess the same inherent rights. And I believe that the legitimate government of this state has to be based on the consent of the governed and must exist to secure those rights for both students and adults. This is how I think about that in education. Students' rights are a very precious and fragile thing. And if you have something precious and fragile, you usually keep it in a safe place. You have an item that's so precious to you, you keep it in a box. And so if you think of youth rights in a box, and there aren't four sides to the box, they're going to leak away. And for me, those four sides are the work of regulation, what school boards, policies they enact, the work of legislation, what laws a state puts together, the work of negotiations, how we work in this case with our 11 labor unions so that adults are honored and so are student, and in cases, litigation. So when all else fails, you pray for redress in the very system that was founded some 200 years ago. It's not popular sometimes to have the beliefs and it's certainly not popular sometimes to have to watch a 10, 12, 14, or 16-year-old take a stand and say things for which there is a huge debate over. But I'm very struck by the fact that this district has built six of the most astonishing schools on a piece of property not far from here that once stood as the Ambassador Hotel. And I need not go through the entire history of the hotel, but we certainly know that that is the place where RFK accepted the speech of winning the California primary to go on as he was running for president of the United States and of course was struck down at that hotel. But I'm more taken by his comments in 1966. He was in South Africa at the time. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against an injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million centers of energy and daring, they build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of opposition and resistance. We have not struck down the wall of educational apartheid in this country. You can take one day in a car and go to Hesby Oaks Elementary School, and the same day go to Coliseum Elementary School, and they are but one very small example of very unequal situation circumstances for the same sets of students. Students and the data in LA, they're not faceless. There's 600,000, and when I do preschool and adult ed, it's 906,000. All of our students come to school expecting to be great. Now the majority, more than 85%, live in circumstances of poverty and peril. The majority do not speak English as their first language yet. The majority are by no means white and privileged. Most struggle to have health care. We think 30 to 40 percent in their homes are currently not documented. And every single one of them wants to graduate college workforce ready and they want to be you. They want a roof over their head. They want to participate in this thing called the democratic dream of this country, and we brook nothing that will stand in their way. It does make people uncomfortable at times. I understand that. But to be uncomfortable, you'd have to meet the students who live in cars behind Huntington Park High School, because that is their home. To have to understand what it is to be uncomfortable, you have to meet students where 14 people live in a two-bedroom apartment in Pacoima. 
because the rest of the families have lost their homes and still will be the first to graduate from high school. If we want to understand uncomfortable, you could have been with me two months ago, excuse me, two weeks ago, when we did a routine dental screening, third graders. You know, the dentist comes in, checks your teeth. 3,000 students on that day, 126 had abscesses so bad they required immediate medical attention. How does one learn to read when you need an abscess that requires immediate medical attention? And no one would have known if we hadn't done the routine dental screening. Now that is discomfort. I meet students who have just become moms, who are expecting. And a year ago sat with a group of students, and not one had seen an OBGYN to the day they had had their child. This is the United States of America today. Those things make me uncomfortable. Now there's been critics, some loud, some shrill, some thoughtful, some silent. I'm gonna speak about the themes of those critics and then close and how I think about this case. Some say this has been an attack on teachers' rights. I would say quite the opposite. This has been an attempt to talk about the rights of students, not the rights of teachers. And in no case has someone advocated that those rights be diminished whatsoever. Some say that the issue on tenure is to strike it down. It should be very, very clear. It has never been part of the testimony I gave or was deposed under or believe in. What we've said about this issue of tenure is that it should take into account a reasonable period of time to make such an awesomely important decision. And that solely choosing just 14 months to make the decision of a lifetime is not actually honoring the rights of teachers who get better over time. And we need to give them the time to show that they can do that. There was a great deal of criticism about the last in, first out. You know, it works just fine. It is an objective criteria. The fact that you can't argue the objectivity of the date of hire. Why not use height? That's extremely objective. <laughs> it is visible to everybody. Everyone understands it. I would argue that no one would do that either. All we are suggesting is there are phenomenal things that teachers do. Allow them to be taken into consideration. And in LA, this wasn't about first and second year teachers. When we had finished the second round of layoffs when the state was borderline bankrupt, eight and nine year teachers were being laid off. That is not a new teacher. That is a person who has had a long track record of giving to students. There was quite a bit of debate about the methodology for evaluating teachers. That actually wasn't part of the trial whatsoever. The whole notion is whatever a district chooses on how to evaluate teachers, it should be but a factor when trying to make the terrible decision about having to deal with layoff. There was chatter about, is it a billionaire who's funding this? I think it's pretty clear that the money spent on the trial is nothing compared to your year's worth of dues that are taken. It happens to be one person. Money is used all the time, except out of students' pockets for their rights. It was talked that it would get rid of due process. You can't abrogate the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution of this country, not whatsoever. You know, King, when he wrote in his letter from a Birmingham jail, noted that, that we had wait and waited more than 300 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward the goal of political independence, and we still creep at a horse and buggy pace at gaining so much as a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. It may not be for the students of LAUSD or California the cup of coffee, figuratively, but that cup of coffee is a high school diploma. That is what students demand and need. And I believe that no one in LA is confused about our mission. We lift youth out of poverty every day, and we need to use the means necessary granted by our Constitution 
that when folks are aggrieved, they have the same right for redress as you and I do when we feel aggrieved about that. I don't know what the outcome to Vegara will be. It's not for me to speculate. But what I do know is that the conversation raised in this trial talks about issues that have for a long time disproportionately affected some students and not other students. And if we will work in summer school for students who struggle, and we will do TK for students who struggle, and we will create classes so students can learn English proficiently, and we will do X and Y and Z, we would then want to make sure that they had the same right to the same quality of education as any student in LASD or any other school system. A lot's been written about the trial. A lot's been talked about the trial. Um, I do invite, however, people who want to be thoughtful critics, just come work a day in LA with youth. Then I think people can hear that criticism a lot easier. A healthy debate is always welcomed. Screaming and yelling, tweeting or otherwise, without the benefit of the sweat equity side by side of the youth in the city, it tends to get drowned out by the need to provide medical care, family assistance, fuel, food. Just leaving the school yesterday, excuse me, leaving the school Friday, as I was finishing this talk, visited Nevin Elementary School. And it was a Friday, like every Friday, and the school ends by every student getting two grocery bags of food that will help them through the weekend. That is separate and unequal. Thank you. You know, it isn't very often that I get a chance to listen to a public official give us his philosophical and intellectual journey that you went through to get to your policy stance and what you've been doing. So I appreciate that, John, personally, and I think most of us do out there. I also excited about the next part of this presentation. So while the members of the uh, panel are coming up here, I want to introduce our moderator. Uh, Dr. Catherine Strunk is Associate Professor of Education and Policy at USC Rossier <laughs> and is a, has a courtesy appointment in the Price School of Public Policy. Her areas of expertise include teachers' unions and education governance, teacher labor markets, and accountability policies. Her research focuses on questions concerning the causes of teacher attrition, the retention and recruitment of high quality teachers, and the impact of teachers' unions on district and school level processes. She also studies the relationship between teachers' unions and school boards. This year, Dr. Strunk was among the top 200 education scholars cited by Rick Hess of the American Enterprise Institute as one whose work has most influenced the national educational discourse. She is currently in the midst of a study of LIUSD's public, choice, public school choice initiative, and we couldn't think of a better moderator for today. Please welcome Dr. Strunk. <clears throat> First, I want to thank John for the wonderful speech, and I'm very excited to have two other esteemed panelists with us. I'll just do a quick, quick, brief introduction. We have Susan Estrick with us from the School of Law. She is the Robert Kingsley Professor. She is also a partner at Quinn Emanuel or Carton Sullivan. Before coming to USC, uh, Professor Estrick was at Harvard Law School, and as a student at Harvard, she was the first woman president of the Harvard Law Review. Um, she's been very active in politics for over three decades and was the first woman to run a national presidential campaign. She has substantial history in education reform. She was a founding board member of Green Dot Charter Schools and has since become a founding board member of the Future Is Now Schools, and we are very thrilled that she could be here with us today. We also have Dr. Julie Marsh with us. Dr. Marsh is an associate professor of education here at Rossier. Before coming to USC, Julie was a senior researcher at RAND and received her doctorate from Stanford and her MPP from UC Berkeley. Dr. Marsh studies education policy implementation, education reform, and accountability. I should give myself away that say Dr. Marsh is my co-principal investigator in the study of public school choice as well as our study of the teacher incentive fund grant at LA Unified. 
And Dr. Marsh does far more than that. She also has studied coaches, curricular reforms, data-driven decision-making, teacher compensation and evaluation policies, as well as school turnarounds. So I think we have some really qualified panelists to talk today. Um, I recently read an article that said we should do away with moderators completely and let people talk, so I hope to do that. The first thing we sh uh, wanted to do is give everyone two minutes to respond to John's talk, and so we'll start with Susan, go to Julie, and then let John finish off. And I will cut you at two minutes, and when you're speaking and answering questions, I will cut you at four minutes. So just know that I'm pretty hard about that. Susan, you want to start? Sure. I did radio for years, so I know 30, 60, 90, and 2. Here we go. Fast. <laughs> First of all, I want to say a real tribute to John because we are so fortunate in Los Angeles. And if you want, I'll do my diatribe against LAUSD and our school board. But we are so fortunate to have someone who I believe is one of the preeminent educational leaders in America. And equally important, basically has the same accent as everyone in my family. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look at this panel, Boston, Boston. I don't know about you ladies. <laughs> when I first started, and it'll be very fast, when I first started teaching, I was very involved in the criminal justice system work. And what always struck me was that we were asking the criminal justice system not just to deal with crime, but to deal with every other problem for disadvantaged folks that we had no other systemic solution to. And one thing that struck me about 15 years later when with my friend Steve Barr, who had worked with me in politics when we started Green Dot, was that we were asking the education system now to deal not just with teaching our kids to read, but with dental problems and health problems and family problems and the like. So I think our challenge is in a society where the mission of the schools goes so far beyond what happens between 9 and 3 every day, how do we do, as John said, how do we give students real equality? And it's not real equality when, you, you know, when you're going to give my kid and a kid with nothing exactly the same resources. How do we give kids real equality? How do we protect dedicated teachers who need to be protected against arbitrary action? And at the same time, ensure that guys like John have the support they need at the political level to accomplish their mission, and that principals who we hold accountable can be responsible. Two? Very good. Julie? Um, I, too, want to thank John and also say how humbling it is to have had a, such an eloquent history lesson from a former science teacher. <laughs> so um, anyways, I was, couldn't get that out of my head the whole time you were talking. Um, I also just want to say how much I respect the sense of moral obligation that you have and your conviction on this issue, which has been sort of the center of your, your career. And since coming to LAUSD three years ago, it has been very consistently the message that you have sent to, to everyone in, in the city um, around the rights of youth and around this issue around having a quality teacher. And you, mo you spoke a lot about having um, the, the importance of quality instruction, and I think everyone here obviously believes in that as well. We share your, your beliefs. Um, I wanted to speak sort of broader to the issue of beyond Vergara, um, to get at the quality instruction, we have to move beyond just the, the statutes that we're talking about here, and I think you would agree. Um, so I just want us to keep in mind when we're talking about these issues, broader issues around capacity building, that you know, just getting rid of dismissal or extending the period of tenure isn't going to get us our ultimate goal, which you articulated, which is quality instruction. I also think we need to keep in mind, so the supports for the teachers, we have to keep in mind uh, issues around leadership and school leadership is, is also quite important. Um, I also want us to think about the broader issues that, why is it that you say when all else fails, we go to the courts? Well, why should it be that we have to go to the courts? And I feel like there are issues on the table that we aren't addressing around governance of, of our public schools. 
Um, and so why should it be that a superintendent who wants to get these things accomplished has to now um, litigate to get that? So I think there's some other broader issues that maybe we can come back to um, that were raised to me when you were speaking so eloquently. John, do you want to respond? Yeah, I think um, what um, there's a whole bunch of issues which had nothing to do with this particular trial that are at the edge of demand. And you spoke about some of them. I mean, we have such a woeful disinvestment in our teachers and leaders in California. I mean, I am, we're all incredibly grateful um, that we're able to get some new money into schools. And uh, apart from that, I am personally profoundly grateful to the governor for leading the transformation of how we'll distribute that money. But let's just be really honest for a second. In the year 2021, when the investment is full, we will be where we were in 2008. So this is not like some fantastic new thing that is about to happen to California. So in the year 2021, we'll have the same amount of money per child than 2008. That's a very worrisome level of state investment um, in, in um, our teachers and in our, in our administrators. Um, and the other piece is, and I'm gonna say this cause I'm here at the academy, and I would say that at any academy, I mean, we have to think very differently about the money that comes to schools of education versus schools of business, science, engineering, medicine, or law. And that they can't simply be the school that is producing the very and most critical element education on the same kind of shoestring budget overall and think that we're gonna get this done. Um, and then the last thing I would say, again, not having to do with this, but these are other issues out there. If we're going to begin a fundamental shift in these supports, we have to live true to the local control funding formula, which is rolling out for the first time next year, which will mean that those who have the least will get the most. Um, and that's gonna be a very difficult public policy, I think, for folks to understand in the state. Great. So I wanna kind of go off of that for a second and talk about, John, you had mentioned that uh, Vergara is not new and there have been a lot of kinds of impact litigation and uh, litigation around education policy in California and more and more nationally. What do you think it is about California laws specifically and the way we fund and operate schools in California that have created the need to go to the courts to such an extent? Uh, I, I, I think it's two, two uh, very different reasons. One is uh, I'm not a constitutional scholar, so this is an opinion. And if I'm wrong, I think we should correct this, but it's also the general belief. Our state constitution is stronger on these issues. So therefore, when you go there, you're having a conversation not about what we think it says or what it might say as in other states. It's a very clear and compelling statement around right uh, access uh, and, and um, due process. So therefore, you tend to get action. That would be one thing. The second thing is, um, I think it's the nature of a gigantic um, enterprise. I mean, we're like a nation. Um, and so uh, usually the larger and more diverse, the less unified in opinion. And so um, resolution is found most normally through the court system when it comes to the most vulnerable. Good. Susan, did you want to add? Yeah. Finally, my area. Okay. <laughs> He's very good for a science teacher. If I had to do science like he was doing law, would be dead. But the fact is that the federal constitution has been interpreted, I believe, wrongly, wrongly, to reject the idea of equality in educational opportunity when it comes to resources, that is, Separate but equal, inherently unequal, Brown v. Board of Education, all the, those are race cases. When it came to the United States Supreme Court that education funding, I believe the state was Texas, Rob, right? That education funding was fundamentally unequal and in violation of equal protection because being based on a local property tax model, it meant that those who had the most got the most, those who had the least 
got the lease. The argument was made to the United States Supreme Court that that was unconstitutional, and the court basically said, life's not fair. So the reason we see more of this litigation in California than in other states is because it's very hard to bring impact litigation in the education area under the federal constitution until we have a Supreme Court majority that will reverse that fundamentally <laughs> wrong decision. The other reason you see more in California, so I can piss off everybody here, is because, frankly, I was shocked to find tenure in the statutory language in California. I mean, I really was shocked. Most states do not provide by law the, 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 the requirement or the establishment of effectively one and a half years to tenure. And had this been merely in collective bargaining agreements rather than state law, the grounds for this lawsuit would have been very difficult. And when you ask yourself, this is when I'm going to piss people off, when you ask yourself, how is it that this became a state statute that governs tenure, you know, the answer is that our teachers unions, and I have been very supportive, I work with the president of the AFT nationally on union reform, I do believe in, in unions and I do believe in protection for teachers. But the power of the teachers union and its resistance to change, and its resistance to change even when that change would serve the interests of the overwhelming majority of good teachers and excellent teachers, the power of that teachers union has hobbled, I believe, reform in this city. Thank God we've still got John, right? The, the very idea that we were at risk of losing him was ridiculous. But, you know, between the power of the teachers union and the legislature's uh, addiction to money and the contributions of teachers unions to support them, we are in a funny situation in California. We've got a better constitution on the one hand, but we've also got enshrined in the statute books uh, legislation like this, which frankly is, came as a surprise to me. What did you want to add? Uh, just to add, I would think we have, you know, we all know the enormous ed code that we have in the state of California. And so on other issues, even in this case, seniority, um, California is one of four states, I think, that actually says that you have to take into consideration seniority and layoffs. There's about five others that make it the sole factor. The rest of the states leave it up to the districts, say that you can take it into consideration. A couple say you actually can't take it. So we have this enormous ed code. So I do think it leads to... Uh, the impatience and the frustration that often gets us to these impact litigation court cases, which is really a frustration with the legislative process. And so, as John said, you know, when all else fails, you go to the courts. To what degree is the centralization of control at the state level part of the problem here then? So we have this massive education code that dictates a lot about our district policy. We have like, tenure or layoffs. Um, we have state funding that goes, for the most part, through the state. To what extent could we do something different if we had more local control at the district and school level? Well, I mean, I think John said that we're starting to see a bit of change right now with the local control funding formula, which is trying to give more flexibility and more discretion at the local level. So, but that, there's, you know, we're still, we're in the early phases of that. So I think, I don't think we know yet, but I think we're moving in that direction. I think until now we could have said, California um, had really limited, it was quite centralized. I think we're shifting a bit um, in our new funding formula. So I think the jury's still out on that one, in my opinion. I, w I would also agree, I don't think that we know enough if that's an issue that you know forms problems like this. Um, I think if this was solely about money, which it had nothing to do with finances, then I think the opinion would be that um, we've known through a tough lesson in this state that absent some centralization around policy, you have gross disparity. But I don't know if it's true on these other issues. You guys are more expert about the ed code. It has always shocked me about education, just this fundamental idea. You know, people move to, and I'm a mother, you know, 
People move to fancy, wealthy suburbs where their kids get much better education because they've got strong support, the property tax system, the middle class base. You know, the politics of education are completely backwards. The rich get the most, even though the rich, quite frankly, need the least. We can help our own kids. The people at the bottom who need the most often get the least. I think some of the effort to move towards state control was an effort to, to, to balance mm. that off. Um, in big cities, public schools have lost their middle class constituencies as people have pulled their kids into private school and therefore no longer see it as their problem. Um, you know, and, and when I try to do education politics, I am forever till I'm blue in the face saying to private school parents, don't you get that if we don't have good public schools, it doesn't matter that your kid went to a fine private school. They're going to live next door to you, be part of the same society. You know what I'm saying. But convincing people who have given up on the public schools for their own children. When I was growing up, John, most of us, you know, you either went to Catholic school or you went to public school. That was it, right? So, so I, I, I have a, um, a hypothesis that if there was a law in California where all the legislators had to send their own child to public school, you would see very different sets of legislation. Of course you would. He's absolutely right. And, and so then when they come around and say, well, but aren't these you know, private school people funding this litigation? Well, somebody's got to fund it, right? I mean, I really think the problem is that too many people in our society with wealth and power are not involved in the public schools. They don't send their kids there. They don't see it as their problem. And therefore, you can be in a place like Los Angeles and you know, be in a group of academics, even, and find that nobody's got kids in the public school. Mm -hmm. And particularly with working mothers, right? Working mothers will say to me, look, I don't have time to devote the kind of time I would need to to the public school to make sure that my kid gets the right teacher and the right resources and the right everything. So that middle class constituency, which was mostly, frankly, women, mothers who were in there every day, are at work and they'll say to me, I'm sorry, I wish my kids were in public school, but I have to work so my kids are in private school because I trust the private school to take better care of them. I think we need a political mind shift here that says the richer you are, the more you should feel obliged and obligated to ensure that everybody gets the kind of education your kid does. We can all hope. <laughs> so I'm going to ask one more question, and then I would like to open it up to the, um, to the audience for questions. We do have two microphones at the aisles. And so if you want to ask a question, you should sort of make your way that direction. Um, so the last question I'm going to ask, and I could ask 30 more questions, so if no one wants to ask, better for me. Um, the question I want to ask is, so what happens? Even if Vergara doesn't, they don't win, the plaintiffs don't win, or the plaintiffs do win, what is the precedent that we're setting? What is the next step? What do, where do we go from here? I'll have to turn Can it to I Susan do one? first. We need you guys to succeed. I mean, I think John's a superstar. I'm just here as humor. But we need these two <laughs> women to succeed. Because what we really need to do is we need to have fair and objective measures that people can trust of effectiveness in teaching and quality so that teachers can have some assurance that they will be treated fairly, not punished arbitrarily, get the support they need, that we won't simply do the test game, right? Where, you know, you teach to the test and if your kids don't go up, you know, you're gonna be out of a job. I really think it's the work you guys are doing, as well as the work John is doing, that is essential to get a shift here. Because however this case comes out, as John says, we've gotta have fair ways. I mean, I'm a tenured professor, so what am I gonna say? Tenure is wonderful for me, but forget for you guys? No. 
we've got to have fair ways of judging teachers so that good teachers can entrust their future knowing they'll get the support they need to learn to teach and not be treated in an arbitrary fashion. I, I don't know the answer to this question. How long did it take you to get tenure? Really fast. What was it? <laughs> but it was the old days. You see, I started at Harvard when I was 15. <laughs> I got it really fast. It was the old days. But even I had to wait, I think. I got it right. It's the old days. It was really fast, and I was the first girl. So it all helped. There you go. But even I had to wait probably four years. And oh. now people wait. I'm it's looking for my dean. Six. My it's six. Six. Oh, wow. typically yeah. six or okay. seven. I was just wondering. And produce substantial work in all of that. Um, I do believe in tenure. Yeah, but, so do I. <laughs> but I also believe that it should be earned, and I believe it should be earned fairly. And I don't think it's a, a license for abuse. And everybody here will know the old tenure joke. I just got tenure. I killed the rats. When I got tenure, I have to say, I started teaching gender discrimination because everybody told me I couldn't get tenure if I was teaching gender discrimination because it didn't really count as a subject. So the day I got tenure, I said, fine, I'm teaching gender discrimination. <laughs> So but John, John, other than teaching gender sorry, discrimination. I no, okay. um, so I actually don't know what it means to win or lose in this. So I think that there are, um, it's an interesting question. So I think um, whether the judge, uh, whatever the decision the judge makes, I think there's an opportunity for a lot of people and lots of groups of people to exercise some very powerful and possibly heretofore groundbreaking leadership. I think there's a window of opportunity for labor leadership um, to really um, step forward and suggest and lead changes um, in both platforms around collective bargaining and or legislation. Because like every other constituency, they fund legislation to take place and lobby for it. I think it's also an opportunity, very much what Susan was saying, for parents and guardians to become much more activated um, in terms of the demand side of what this could be. So I don't know what it means of which, whether the side would be a win, but I do know, I believe deeply, it's just not going to go away. Um, you know, I've thought, I think that we're seeing other states watching this case, so I think should the plaintiffs win, I think we're going to see a lot more kinds of suits like this going on around the country. And I think it opens up the opportunity for more kinds of cases like this because now we might be able to more broadly define these rights for students. And so uh, you might see other kinds of resources that you were bringing up. You, you had a long list, so we might just keep adding to that list mm. um, access to a high quality principal, um, ability to attend a school that's socioeconomically diverse, um, on and on. So I think it opens up the possibility should the the plaintiffs win um, for more kinds of litigation like this. I also um, have concerns about the implementation should it succeed, as you alluded to. Um, just because we get a court decision doesn't mean we actually get change. Right. And, um, and so that will take, and if we have the political situation that we still have and we have resistance to the ruling, um, I think there's some concern about what happens next. Um, and so, as we saw with Brown versus Board of Education, we're still fighting that fight, and we're seeing resegregation and race and, and all of that right now. So I, I, I have some skeptical views about the next steps should, should this case succeed. Um, and to Susan's point about that we need an evaluation, I appreciate the endorsement of our work, but I think it's not enough. And I think, as I said before, just because we then have a fair system to evaluate our teachers, doesn't mean we're going to get to improvement for some of those who are deemed as perhaps ineffective or who need more help. And so that's where I really do think we need more around the coaching and the supports for, for teachers. And I know that's a, an, also um, a priority in LAUSD and around the country, and I think our research really shows that we need to support teachers, um, provide them really good feedback from these evaluations, but also the resources and the professional development opportunities to actually make improvements. Can I ask mm -hmm. one question to you three? Are you worried that this lawsuit demonizes teachers and allows people to say, ah, the problem with the schools is not the other 99 items on your list. The problem with the schools is teachers in particular, tenured teachers in particular, 
the teachers' union, because in my experience, yeah, there are some lousy teachers out there. There were some lousy lawyers out there. There were some lousy professors out there. But the overwhelming, and you tell me, but the overwhelming majority of people I know who are in teaching are pretty damned good, working unbelievably hard and committed. And, and I wonder if this raises issues about whether they're being unfairly blamed when you know, inadequate teachers are not necessarily the biggest piece of the problem. Yeah, I actually worry about that a lot. Um, I happen to agree with you 100%. Uh, the overwhelming majority of teachers are just beyond um, amazing. I mean, my jaw is usually on the ground when I visit schools and teachers in very, um, and, and you know, we didn't talk about this. I mean, actually to teach is rocket science. To, to help um, a young person scaffold enough knowledge to understand how to read is probably the most complex task you're going to help any human do other than acquire speech. Incredibly difficult, and then you can go on from there. I, I think that most of the kind of chatter has got nothing to do actually with the case itself. So you could spin a narrative, which I think would be very, very difficult. Um, I equally worry about the fact that, that you know, it's, there's another side there I worry about. That's just about poor kids. If we didn't have them, we wouldn't have these problems. Mm -hmm. And that the worry about what we need is to have less worry about this. And so I think both sides of that are, are um, to use your word, are really worrisome in the case. Julie, do you want to add to that? I don't think there's a lot to add other than that. I, I see how that, and I see that's been the spin from the sides of folks writing about the case over the past month. Um, but I think if you think about some of the teachers who are less experienced, who got those rifts and who were laid off, um, who were trying so hard, who were probably just as effective as some of those senior teachers, for them, this kind of ruling could actually really support those teachers. And it's about demonstrating that you are effective in the classroom. So I would hope that this case could advance the cause of supporting just teacher effectiveness and, and the importance of high quality teaching um, without demonizing the teachers. That we, that we sort of elevate the issue here that it's not about seniority, that it's not about a certain amount of time, but it's really about demonstrating your ability to be effective in the classroom and how we support that through not just these laws but other, mm. other, other structures. Agreed. Anyone that wants to ask a question in the audience? Go ahead. Hi, my name is Lisa Alva. I'm a teacher at Roosevelt High School. I have been a teacher for 16 years. And I'm so captivated by all of this conversation. Thank you so much for allowing me to come and to ask you a couple of questions. Um, Professor Estrich made an interesting comment about who funded the, um, the Vergara trial and how it was pr private school interests. I'm very interested to know more about that, so I'd like to yeah. find out how to investigate. But I, I, I mean, I don't know how you investigate. I just know that was one of the questions, as you referred yeah. to, that kept getting answered, that there were, you know, organizations based, I guess, up in... Because that's kind of like house. your mother-in-law coming and telling you how to keep house, but we won't go there right now. I want to make a... Uh, I wanted to ask another com uh, question. Um, at my school, we use student focus groups to get student input on ter in terms of our curriculum, our leadership and governance, our instruction, our assessment, those things, and I find them very powerful uh, as I run them myself. Um, but I'm also a committee chair in UTLA, and the people that I interact with in UTLA and in trying to develop union membership are people that are more interested in a professional association rather than an industrial model union or, you know, to some extent even a social justice um, union model. We're very interested in a professional association. And so my question for Professor Marsh is, you mentioned earlier that you, want, you had some ideas about governance and leadership and how that can improve the efficacy of the teaching um, profession. Um, at my school, we are operating on a skeleton crew. It's very difficult for our administrators to get into classrooms. So I just want to like make you aware of that and then ask for your ideas. Okay, wow, a lot was packed into that. Um, I wanted to speak to the issue of funding for a minute too. So there has been a lot of criticism around the funding of this. There was a, a 
an organization that's being funded by a very wealthy Silicon Valley um, uh, individual. And I guess I want to point back to the point that was made earlier by John, which was that um, we have money in politics and in education policy on all sides. And so labor unions have been giving donations to elected officials at the state and local level and for ballot initiatives and if we think about lobbying. So I guess I just think we should really pay attention to if we're going to talk about the issue of money and, and its effect on education policy, we need to think broadly about all ways that money is getting into affecting our policies that are affecting your classroom, um, essentially. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, your point about governance and, and leadership changes, is that the question that you have? Or sort of what are some of the ideas? Um, I was thinking more broadly about some of the issues, so I wanted to understand, and I'd be interested in, in Dr. Daisy's thoughts about how we can sort of prevent the political gridlock that seems to be occurring in our districts and in our state where you have to feel that you need to go to the courts to get some of these issues addressed. So you mentioned in your testimony in Vergara that you've been trying to implement even the recommendations of Doe v. Daisy to implement the evaluation system that you've been told to now implement and that time and time again, I forget what your specific point was, that you've been challenged by every step you've made in trying to implement the evaluation. So I don't know what is the answer for you in terms of what can you do as an individual superintendent when you aren't able to get anything sort of passed at the local level? So do we think we need mayoral control? Do we think that we need a more sort of market-based system that Paul Hill and others have talked about, which is a more sort of portfolio model where we try to decentralize a bit and we have sort of schools now more in charge of the hiring and all these issues and that the district now plays more of a kind of coordinating function of oversight? You know, there may be more drastic sort of models we might want to start thinking about for the governance of our schools. If we keep getting to one, the amount of money that's going into the school board elections and the gridlock that seems to be occurring, is it time for something different? That's what I'm trying to raise here. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to the question, obviously. Um, I think that it's very complex, and I think organizations like LAUSD and UTLA are very complex organizations. And <clears throat> I, my, my sense is two things. One is most of the membership of UTLA is just working too hard to get involved in kind of this, um, some of the stuff that might or might not create gridlock. I mean, folks just, just are working themselves, you know, to the bone. And just want it to be better. Um, and it's a political organization just like LAUSD is at times a political organization. And I think what strikes me is that they're just, um, if you take your second example and bring decision making closest to students, I guess it would be an interesting strain of conversation to have so could labor do the same thing? Could it bring its decision making closer to the schools? So could schools actually have much more autonomy around the things which are centrally, quote, bargained? Because I, I would use your example, the student body and the conditions of those students and your challenges look very different at Roosevelt than they do Canoga Park. Um, it's not the same across the system this large. Um, and I think that that's a very interesting conversation to possibly enter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Blue shirt, questions? Hi, David Tukovsky, um, recovering school board member. <laughs> um, thank you for that question, which is really the question I learned about is the unintended consequences of policy making. But my question is to the two law professors on the panel. Um, yes, that's right. Um, is um, Anita Hill, warned us that Clarence Thomas was both abusive and incompetent. Um, what reforms would you put in place based upon one of nine Supreme Court justices being allegedly incompetent, hasn't spoken in 23 years, and abusive, that wouldn't produce the unintended consequences of what Rosebird and the California Supreme Court experienced under the progressive democratic reforms of the turn of the century? Uh, 
I'm not sure where that. Um, the the Clarence Thomas has tenure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he right? sure does. Susan, so, do you want to take a quick pass? So at my that question one? is really, there there can be good intentions, but the path may produce what the progressive did here in California, where we opened up election of our Supreme Court and lost a very visionary, much like the speech, a visionary Supreme Court here in California based upon um, the election process. So I, I think it was touched by the panel. What happens after the court case is very important in terms of making sure that the best intentions mm -hmm. are embodied in the unwritten implementation that could produce great and great results or unintended consequences. Susan, you want to take a quick pass at it and then we'll, you can also pass on a question. If you the have purpose of judges having life tenure was to have people like Earl Warren, mm -hmm. all right, a Republican governor from California who with life tenure, looking at a situation, changed America. Or a William J. Brennan of New Jersey, another Republican appointee to the United States Supreme Court, who with life tenure and integrity, changed his views and became one of the court's leading liberals. Or a Hugo Black, formerly, some said, a KKK supporter, who later became the greatest champion of First Amendment freedoms. The purpose of tenure is to ensure that good teachers at every level know that they will not be subject to arbitrary intimidation and layoffs because they are doing their best and speaking their views and addressing situations. And I guess my only answer would be to say, and that's why I pointed to your work, I know there's, you know, there is a tenure and teachers unions are political, as you know, hot buttons. And that's why I was asking about demonization. If we're going to move against tenure in any way, shape, or form, change it, restrict it, eliminate it, seems to me it's critical that we have ways to fairly evaluate teachers because I'm one of the old people now. I used to be one of the young people. And I do remember when you know the NEA was getting started. And a lot of teachers were resistant to unionization because they thought of themselves as professionals, not as Teamsters. But the reality was that it was the only protection against arbitrariness, which, which came for reasons that were often unfair. So, so my answer simply is to encourage, especially those who are supporting lawsuits like this, to pay as much attention to what the new system looks like and how to make it right as they do to what's wrong with the old system. Great. So I think we have time for one more question. So sorry, we have a reception at six. People will be around yeah, and we'll be and happy. You delayed the question. I'll make a real statement. I don't want to judge more. Ask me easy when you judge me at the board. One more and question. That's my computer in public, people, on television. That's, that's federal law. Thank you, the young man in blue. At the Thank you. I think my question's real. We'll see. <laughs> I think a lot of these are <laughs> real. So, if the plaintiffs were to win and the tenure process were to be adjusted, what would that ideally entail? And would school site administrators, who up until this pain, up until this point, may look for one or two big indicators of effectiveness, be equipped in terms of time and resources to actually evaluate new teachers in this ideal framework? I mean, I think it's a really important question for which there's no um, path that was laid out in the trial that would be able to answer that. So. I think like um, Mr. Tukowski, the subject of tenure wasn't, as, as I followed the trial, whether we should have it or not. That wasn't the case. As a matter of fact, both sides argued strongly that it should be in place. 
It was the length of time to determine it, not if it should happen. And I don't have the slightest idea what this judge would do, nor would I hazard a guess. I look at other trials, bench trials in particular. In most cases that are this weighty and this significant, um, and Susan, your perspective, if you would help me if you think I'm off base, judges have tended to issue a ruling on the constitutionality of the law, but stayed it till whatever body could make the corrective action. So the body here is the General Assembly in Sacramento. Since they create the law, they can amend, adjust, or modify it um, to be within the framework of what was unconstitutional about it. So I think it's a misnomer to say that this would be about striking down tenure. I think it is that tenure as it exists in the time frame to get it either is or isn't you know, a, uh, a violation of some group of students' due process, um, uh, equal protection under the law. So one avenue could be, okay, this is the framework that has to be corrected. Would the body that creates it please correct it? Um, I don't, I suspect the judge could issue a decision from the bench, although I don't know if that is common in a bench trial. Well, I think, John, you're right. When we first when I first started getting involved with public impact litigation, first started studying it and being involved back in the 70s, we had judges trying to run school districts okay. and judges running hospitals and judges running police departments. And I used to support that compared to the people who were running them instead. But the reality is, if you want to bring about real change, you can't have the judges running the system. Right. So I think many of us in the sort of progressive side have come to understand that the goal of these lawsuits is to change the table, okay? To, to give certain people more power at the table, to put pressure on the responsible institutions to, to address the problems rather than I would hope, I say, rather than for a federal judge or a state judge who probably knows much less than these three people by a million miles. He shouldn't be the one to fix the problem. The goal, I think, would be to, to change the dynamics, change the leverage, and give some power and impetus to those who should be responsible. And I just want to validate your point about principles, because you're right that when we come down to implementing whatever is decided and whatever system we start, it will fall upon principles. Already in these new evaluation systems that we're seeing across the country, and we have in LAUSD, the principles role is critical. And you're right that there's challenges here with the time that they have to spend to do the evaluation, to perhaps now make these judgments um, around dismissal and all this. And so I do think we need much more attention in the policy realm around how we get more supports for, teach mm. for principals, how we train them to do this, to recognize good teaching, to do the work. I mean, it requires a lot of investment as well and attention. So I think it's a really good point. I mean, I think people can have an opinion about what happened with Williams, but that was an absolute outcome of it. There is a problem, and there is a minimum threshold of support that actually has to increase. Great. I do want to thank our panel, Susan, John, Thanks. and Julie. Thanks for coming and having Appreciate this discussion today. Thank you. Today. I do want to encourage you to go up to the first floor. There are refreshments up there, and all of these individuals be up there, too. So if you didn't get your question asked, there is an opportunity to talk with them. Thank you all for coming. We're, we're glad you're here. <laughs>